structures on the muon G minus two in physics beyond the standard model uh, topic. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that I missed the first two lecture, but I'm the, the, the happier now that I'll be able to catch the third. So Dominic, thank you very much for being with us for the third time. And I'm really looking forward to your lecture. And for all of you, please interrupt him at any given moment right. and ask questions. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Jan, and thanks to everybody for the invitation and for uh, coming again. So let uh, us begin with our discussion of G minus two. You have by now already seen this plot and the outline for today's lecture is as follows. So I want to begin briefly with a recap of what we did in the first two lectures. What were the take home message and uh, how should we get started today? Then I will continue our discussion that we uh, finished with last time, namely that was a general theory discussion on some relationships between G minus two and other observables which are connected to CP and flavor violation. And today we will particularly focus on the connection to G minus two of the electron. And then I will uh, mainly discuss examples of concrete models. And today the models are not selected by pedagogy, but today the models are really selected by trying to give quite a complete survey of interesting and promising scenarios which can currently explain the deviation between G minus two in the standard model and the experiment. And as we will see, each of those models will be constrained by experimental data from many complementary sources. And that will um, be a central point in our discussion. At the end, I will of course conclude with an extensive conclusion of all the three lectures. Okay, so the summary from the previous lectures is as follows. So we started by saying that the standard model prediction is too low by 25 times 10 to the minus 10. This is a large deviation because it's larger than the uh, standard model weak contributions. And so we need to take into account these four special properties of G minus two. It is loop induced, CP and flavor conserving and chirality flipping. And these complementary properties um, tell us how new physics models can contribute large amounts to G minus two while not being observable elsewhere. Namely, we need to go sp to specific parameter regions in those models, which maximize those complementarities that we see here. And we will see exactly this in our concrete examples later on. So technically last lecture, we uh, went through a few specific models which were selected by their simplicity. So we looked uh, first of all at a simple model with no chiral enhancement for G minus two. And there we first always discuss the relative contribution to the muon mass, which is dimensionless. And in this uh, simple model, we just obtained a loop factor like coupling square divided by 16 pi square, which is a very small prefactor. And G minus two is then given by exactly this factor uh, times muon mass square divided by new physics mass square. And this relationship tells us that in order to explain G minus two, we need rather small new physics masses like 100 GeV or below. And the couplings typically have to be quite large in order to give large enough effects. The second example was a simple leptoquark model where the leptoquark can couple to both left and right-handed muon simultaneously. And then we get a very strong and simple chiral enhancement, namely by the ratio of the top mass compared to the muon mass. So overall, this contribution, this CBSM, is given by the two different left-right-handed leptoquark couplings times the top quark mass over eight pi square mu. So and this prefactor is very large, and so uh, we can easily obtain an order one contribution to the muon mass, and therefore very large contributions to G minus two, and such models can explain the current G minus two deviation, even if the masses are at the TV scale or above. Then I gave a preview on supersymmetry where we also have a strong chiral enhancement, but it's more tricky because one of the two couplings is actually a Yukawa coupling, which is of course related to the muon mass. Therefore, we do not get directly a ratio between new physics mass divided by muon mass, but uh, the mass is cancelled and what is left over is a factor of tangent beta, the ratio of the two vacuum expectation values. But this is still a significant enhancement. 
and therefore also supersymmetry can easily explain G minus two if the Zosi masses are of the order of a few hundred GeV. So I want to briefly remind you of the analysis that we always did for each of the models last time. So we always looked at the explicit loop contribution to the muon mass and to G minus two, which both look very similar. And uh, sometimes the left term, which is coupling square dominates, and sometimes the right term dominates, and uh, the right term is the one which is chirality enhanced. It involves products of left and right-handed couplings, and it involves the mass of the new physics fermion. And uh, so the relative contribution to the muon mass then goes like mf over mu, which is this enhancement. But uh, we should really think in that case, as, uh, as you see at the bottom, as an additive structure. So the muon mass in such models arises as a tree level term coming, for instance, from the standard model, plus an additive loop term which is not proportional to the muon mass. So in this laptop work model, you would just get an additive term, lambda L lambda R times M top, uh, which is an additive extra contribution to the muon mass. Okay, the physics summary from last time was that uh, we discussed simple two field models. They are all either completely excluded as explanations for G minus two, or like in the picture here, they are viable in a very, very small parameter region uh, of masses around 200 GeV, where the relic density, however, is too small. The simple lectoc work models are good explanations of G minus two, so they can do it for a TeV scale or multi TeV scale masses, but fine tuning considerations on the muon mass come into play. So many other simple models are either uh, directly excluded because they predict the wrong sign for G minus two, or um, they are viable in a small parameter space. And the really interesting models out of this uh, very wide class of simple models are the well-known ones, namely a laptop quark, two Higgs doublet model, vector-like leptons, and Z prime. All the no-name models are basically excluded. So, and then we discussed correlations, but uh, let's skip that for now. Okay, so let me continue uh, with this general theory relationships um, coming from CP and flavor violation. So um, that we have discussed. And so now we would like to focus briefly on um, flavor structures in general. So in our simple models from last time, we didn't have any flavor structure, but in uh, most models you can easily imagine or must have a flavor structure. So for example, in supersymmetry, there are of course three generations of sleptons and then the couplings between leptons and sleptons, they are of course matrices in cat generation space. And then there can be Yukawa matrices appearing or uh, gauge couplings, which are um, unit matrices in flavor space. But also in our simple two field models, you could easily imagine a generalization where you have a flavor structure because this new physics fermion in such a simple model must somehow carry lepton number. Therefore, it would only be natural to assume that there are actually three generations of such new fermions. And then you would have a coupling uh, between the muon or leptons and the new fermions with a generation dependent matrix. And the discussion from last time would simply correspond to the case where this matrix has only a 2-2 entry and all the other matrix entries would be zero. But of course you could have uh, all entries being non-zero and then the model would predict a very rich flavor structure. Similarly for the laptop quark model, even if you only have one single laptop quark, uh, the laptop quark couples between quarks and leptons. So naturally the couplings would be not bad numbers but they would be matrices in generation space between quark and lepton generations. And then our current or the previous discussion uh, assumed basically that the three, two entry of the matrices is non-zero and all the other entries are zero. That means that the muon couples to the top quark and nothing else happens. So that's maybe of course can, a very specific flavor structure. Maybe I can ask a first question. Sorry, maybe you already said that, but is, did, is there any constraint on the mass of the laptop quarks? 
Yes, from LAC. So the LAC constrains the laptop quark mass to be above approximately 1.3 TeV. So okay. it must be heavier than 1 TeV, roughly. Okay. Yes. Clearly, it's a colored particle. Therefore, we know how to produce this, and uh, the mass uh, limits are very strong. That's right. Right. And uh, the point of this discussion is that in spite of this strong mass limit, it's no problem at all to explain G minus two with these lepto quarks because um, of this chiral enhancement. But we need a coupling between the muon and the top quark. And that uh, looks a little bit um, strange at first sight. But generally, the message here is that in all these models, we can have, in principle, a non-trivial flavor structure. And then, of course, the correlations that we discussed last time at the end come into play. We will get predictions or correlations between G minus 2 and mu 2 e gamma, or between the uh, electron-electric dipole moment. And those constraints will very strongly restrict uh, the non-zero entries of those flavor matrices. Let me focus for uh, five minutes or so on the question of naive scaling between G minus two of the muon and G minus two of the electron. So this was a leftover discussion from last time. And actually already in the first lecture, we alluded to this discussion. So now we can have it with a little bit more detail. So I always introduce the abbreviation CBSM, which is the relative contribution to the muon mass. And then G minus two is given by this CBSM times muon mass square divided by BSM mass square up to order of magnitude factors. So, and uh, of course, if this CBSM is just a number which is generation independent, then this relationship tells you that uh, the dipole moments of the muon and the electron uh, scale with a square of the lepton mass. So this is the naive scaling. Uh, a mu over a e is uh, equal to a mu square over a e square. And uh, that is basically equivalent to saying that the CBSM is a generation independent quantity. And so that is the case in the standard model. In the standard model, uh, everything is governed by gauge interactions, which are generation universal and therefore naive scaling holds in all um, uh, contributions of the standard model from QED, hadronic contributions and weak contributions. And maybe also in some new physics uh, contributions. So in the MSSM, naive scaling also holds approximately. And in many new physics scenarios, this naive scaling holds. But the lepto quark example provides a case where we plausibly could have a deviation from this naive scaling. Uh, because there, this CBSM would now be given by this chirally enhanced factor, where we have the couplings, lambda L, lambda R times the top mass divided by the lepton mass. And so if we now assume that the lepto quark couplings are actually generation universal, so just a number, then of course, uh, plugging in the CBSM into G minus two cancels one factor of the lepton mass and we get a linear scaling instead of a quadratic scaling. So here we have plausibly a deviation from naive scaling and we have linear instead of quadratic. So that is fine. So that is possible, but now look, please, what happens in the absolute corrections to the masses. So you get a horrifying term uh, which contributes to the muon mass and to the electron mass. So here the muon mass is given by some tree level term, Lukawa times VEF, plus the loop correction, which is then this universal term proportional to the top mass. Similarly, the electron mass is given by the tree level Yukawa times VEF plus a loop correction, which is the same as for the muon and which is proportional to the top quark mass. So what do you want this additional term to be? What should it be? 1 GeV, 10 GeV, 100 GeV, or 0.1 GeV, whatever you choose. But it's the same between the two uh, generations. And so my conclusion from this is, that such an additive term to both generations of leptons is very unplausible unless the term is small. If this is a small correction to both masses, then fine. But if it's a large correction and larger than either of the two masses, then this looks very unplausible to me because how would you obtain 
such a small electron mass and such a small muon mass if you have a universal very large additive uh, term in both cases. So therefore, uh, to me, such a structure and such a model is only plausible if uh, this right term is smaller than the electron mass or at least smaller than the muon mass. And so, but how small can it then be? So if you want to explain G minus two and you have a certain scale for the new physics masses, then you can look at the first line. How large uh, does this CPSM have to be such that you can explain the current G minus two value? And you need a certain minimum value of the CPSM in order to explain G minus two with two TEP new physics masses. And it turns out that this uh, additive mass correction is exactly as large as the muon mass itself if you want to explain G minus two with two TeV new physics masses. And uh, therefore, if the new physics scale is heavier than two TeV, uh, you start getting fine tuning in the muon mass. And if the new physics scale is heavier than 70 GeV only, then uh, already this additive term is bigger than the electron mass. So um, this non-naive, this linear scaling looks only natural to me if the new physics scale is below uh, this value 70 GeV, roughly speaking. So if you have very light new physics, then you might have this uh, linear scaling, but for very heavy new physics, uh, because of this effect, the linear scaling looks unplausible to me. So this is my personal comment on this uh, linear scaling. You can have it for light new physics, but for heavy new physics, probably there is some additional flavor structure in the new physics corrections, which uh, make these mass corrections non-universal. Okay, this ends this discussion of general theory relationships. And now we come finally to concrete promising explanations of G minus two. And uh, here you see the order in which I want to structure the discussion. So I want to start uh, with it. Ah, yeah. Can I just ask a question? Just coming okay. back to the uh, relation between the electron uh, uh, G minus two and the mu and G minus two. If I remember correctly, there was actually also a deviation in the experimental measurement of the electron G minus two, but in the opposite direction, right? Ah, right, uh, but this has gone away. So basically, uh, oh, it has gone away. To, okay. yes, yes, yes. So uh, uh, <laughs> that is important to know. Of course, it was a big discussion when it came out, but it was not such a big discussion when it went away. But uh, it's also not okay, completely okay. right to say it went away. But uh, precisely speaking, there are now two different measurements of um, uh, of the fine structure constant alpha, which are both quite precise. And if you use the two, then you obtain two different predictions for G minus two of the electron. And one has a positive difference to the experiment and one has a negative difference to the experiment. And the differences are in the ballpark of plus minus one to two sigma. So in both cases, it's not a very significant difference and the sign is opposite. And uh, in one case, it's one sigma, in the other case, uh, approximately two sigma difference. Uh, maybe a little bit more. And the difference between the two determinations of alpha overall is a little bit more than three sigma. So uh, I mean, basically uh, that means that the alpha determination has to improve. So the most precise alpha determination used to be from the quantum Hall effect. Is this still the case? Or, or how did they determine alpha? There? Uh, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I cannot tell you. I... No, I really don't know. But there are two determinations, one in, in Paris and the other one, the other one in uh, US, either in Harvard or in Berkeley. I'm not sure. Sorry, I, I can't I can't say. This shows that alpha depends on the, on the spatial coordinate. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, no, it, uh, I, I, I have in the back of my mind that it somehow uh, has to do with rubidium, but whether this, uh, because they always have the simple alpha rubidium, but whether this implies quantum Hall effect measurement, I, I don't know at the moment. Yeah, this issue from the quantum Hall effect is some years back, so maybe in, in the meantime this has been taken over by something else. Yeah. I don't know. 
right? But I mean, as you know, uh, for decades, uh, the best alpha determination came via g minus two of the electron, and therefore you couldn't use g minus two of the electron as a test of QED. And then now there are independent measurements of alpha, which are precise enough so that you can compute g minus two of the electron precisely and compare with a direct measurement. And then this is the result. So there are two basically uh, similarly precise measurements of alpha and uh, therefore two different uh, theory predictions of g minus two of the electron and both have a small, not really significant um, uh, deviation from the g minus two measurement, but uh, going in opposite directions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the two of them differ by more than five sigma, right? Uh, could be that, uh, yeah, maybe. So really the determination yeah. seems to have some uncertainties that are not fully accounted for. Yeah, but uh, it, I think you are right. I think you are right. The two experimental measurements of alpha differ by five sigma. But if you look at the differences to g minus two of the electron, then one differs by one sigma and the other one by two sigma. So there it's not so significant, but between the two alphas, that is the thing that needs yes. to be clarified. Yes. But therefore there is nothing to explain from the point of view of g minus two of the electron. Yes, I think it's uh, completely premature looking mm -hmm. at those measurements. Yeah. Right. Okay, so the outline of the following would be two X doublet model, then MSSM or other SUSE models, lepto quarks briefly and vector-like leptons. And then I would also like to speak briefly on light explanations like set prime or ALPS. Okay, so this is a survey that we don't have to go through, but you can look it up later. Green and red uh, has the obvious meaning of excluded and not excluded. So let's begin with the two Higgs doublet model, which is of course one of the famous and um, let's say directly motivated extensions of the standard model. And in the two Higgs doublet model, there is parameter space where you can explain G minus two. If one of the new Higgses, namely the pseudo scalar A has a mass below 100 GeV. So the two Higgs doublet model generally has a very rich new Higgs sector with many Higgs potential parameters and a rich new Yukawa sector with lots of flavor changing neutral currents. And there are specific versions of the two Higgs doublet model where you get under control the flavor changing neutral currents. And in particular, what is well known are these so-called types, type one, type two, type X and so on. And at the bottom, you see briefly the um, essence namely in type two, which is also the MSSM, um, the Yukawa couplings of the leptons and of the down type quarks are proportional to tangent beta and uh, the up quark Yukawa couplings aren't. In the type X or a lepton specific model, one Higgs couples only to leptons, the other Higgs couples to uh, all the quarks and therefore the lepton Yukawa couplings are enhanced by 10 beta, the quark Yukawas are not. And then there is a generalization of all these types, which is called flavor aligned or aligned to Higgs doublet model, where all these different Yukawa couplings just get generic prefactors zeta L, which replace these 10 beta factors from the type uh, one, two, three models. Okay, and we have uh, done here an analysis of this aligned to Higgs doublet model. Um, and uh, type X was extensively studied in a long series of papers by Chun and uh, different uh, co-authors. And um, so here you see already the results. So let's discuss this. So G minus two in the two Higgs doublet model is given uh, essentially by these two loop so-called bar Z diagrams. So these are diagrams where the new Higgs A couples to the muon and then to um, a, a tau loop or a top quark loop which then couples to the external photon. And uh, so in the type X model, for example, this lepton specific model, both of the A couplings to the muon and to the, sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, both of the A couplings to the muon and the tau are proportional to 10 beta. And then this diagram is uh, proportional to 10 beta square. And so if 10 beta is very large, say of the order 100, and the Higgs mass is small enough, then this diagram is so strongly enhanced that despite being two loop, you can explain the current G minus two value. 
and uh, in the type X model, then the quark you cover couplings are not enhanced. Therefore, the tau loop is really the only one which is relevant. But in this generalized model, this flavor aligned to Higgs doublet model, also the top Yukawa coupling can be simultaneously large. And then also the top loop can play a role because of the large top Yukawa coupling. Okay, then there are, of course, lots and lots of constraints on the two Higgs doublet model with such a light pseudo scalar Higgs with large Yukawa couplings to leptons or quarks. First of all, you have obviously LHC constraints. So if uh, the A and uh, generally the new Higgs is coupled simultaneously to tau and top quarks, then of course you can write down this obvious LHC process, gluon fusion via top loop to the new Higgs, and then the new Higgs decays into tau. Uh, that's obvious, and that would of course be visible at the LHC, and therefore you get upper limits on the possible values of all these Yukawa couplings. And because of those upper limits, G minus two is limited, so you cannot uh, make the Yukawa couplings as large as you might want to do. There are many more constraints. So um, for example, there are also constraints from tau decay, where you would get loop corrections from the new A boson Z into tau, uh, also similar constraints. And all these constraints give you upper limits on the possible values of the Yukawa couplings, similarly B decays. And BTKs, for example, are the reason why you cannot explain G minus two in the type two, two Higgs doublet model, because there, if you have large lepton Yukawa couplings, you also have large bottom Yukawa couplings, and then you ruin uh, B physics constraints. So for all these reasons, you get upper limits and the Yukawa couplings can at most be as large as 100 for the lepton Yukawa couplings. And for the quarks, you get this uh, factor of 0.5, uh, always compared to the standard model you cover coupling. Okay, and because of this, you get these absolute upper limits on the G minus two contributions in this model as a function of MA that you see here in the plot. And the plot shows you that you can explain the current deviation if the new Higgs mass is somewhere between 20 and 100 GeV. And uh, as I said, the upper limits come from all those constraints. So you see, for example, the kink at around 60 GeV, that comes exactly from the LHC limits, where if the Higgs is lighter than half of the standard model Higgs mass, uh, the constraints become stronger. If it's above half the standard model Higgs mass, the constraints become a little bit weaker. That explains the kink and so on. But generally speaking, all those constraints play together uh, to give you those upper limits. And um, so because everything is important, uh, improving on any of those constraints from B physics, tau physics, uh, Z physics, uh, LHC uh, might contribute to completely eliminating this parameter space. But currently it's a possibility. Okay, supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is, of course, uh, the best uh, motivated extension of the standard model and the greatest invention since the wheel. And um, it predicts the Higgs potential and the Higgs mass. It contains a dark matter candidate and it contains a chirality flip enhancement, which gives rise to large G minus two. But the question is whether the LHC has excluded supersymmetry and it has not, of course. Um, for reasons we already discussed last time. And so let me just flash once again this LHC plot. The LHC plot tells you that there are three ways to evade LHC limits, either simply by having high enough masses or by going into this wedge where the mass splitting is rather small. And remember that you do not need a particular fine tuning having masses within 100 GeV or so uh, <clears throat> can easily be sufficient to evade the LHC limits. And the third way is by having different, more complicated decay patterns than is assumed in those LHC searches. So for example, Chargino limits typically become extremely weak if the Chargino is actually a Higgsino, then the limits uh, dramatically reduce. Okay, remarks on dark matter. If we have a Beano-like LSP, then dark matter can be nicely explained, but we need some kind of uh, annihilation mechanism. Uh, and typically, all the best possibilities are Beano Chargino co-annihilation or Beano Slepton or Beano Stau co-annihilation. 
And both of those mechanisms can be well uh, put together with G minus two. There are also the possibilities of Hixino or Wino LSP. That is interesting, but in those cases, uh, the dark matter relic density is underabundant unless the masses are above one TeV, but then we cannot explain G minus two. So G minus two plus Hixino and Wino LSP means that uh, dark matter has to come from elsewhere. Let's spend maybe just one minute on uh, the G minus two analysis in the MSSM. We already discussed it last time briefly as a preview, but now let me uh, be more complete. So we always need three light SUSY masses to get relevant contributions to G minus two. The two most interesting cases are either we know Hixino muon or Bino smu left smu right. In the second case, the Hixino can be very heavy uh, without uh, diminishing the G minus two contributions. So the two relevant diagrams are here. The first one is the one we already discussed last time with virtual Hixino and Wino and Smuon or Smutrino. And the second one does not contain a Hixino. It only contains a Bino, but left and right and it Muon, a Smuon and the chirality flip happens at the muon line. And then this chirality flipping vertex is actually linear in the Hixino mass mu. That is why we get an enhancement with large mu. And so numerically, typically the first diagram dominates, which is why I also showed it last time. And it alone can explain the currently observed deviation if the SUSI masses are of the order 500 GeV and 10 beta is 50 or so. The second diagram is typically smaller, but it can also dominate in particular if the masses are maybe a little bit smaller than 500 and if the Hixino mass is bigger than the other SUSI masses. So let me show you just a few uh, selected plots to illustrate the range of possibilities. Let's begin with this plot, which shows Bino-like LSP, uh, where dark matter is explained by slepton co-annihilation. So this plot assumes Bino-like LSP and the sleptons are close by, roughly within 50 GeV of the LSP. Then dark matter can be explained by co-annihilation, and you see that the plot essentially can easily explain G minus two in the green band. And the green band is for 10 beta 40. If you go up or down with 10 beta, you can explain G minus two almost in the entire plot. So, and uh, here both of these Feynman diagrams are important. So in the left part of the plot where the Hixino mass is light, uh, this um, W or Wino Hixino loop dominates in the right part of the plot where you see this almost linear increase of the blue, the green region. This comes from this uh, BLR diagram with a Smeon left to right flip, which is linear in mu. Okay, and uh, so the point is there are no LHC limits at all in the plot. And the reason is that uh, we have this co-annihilation where the sleptons are close by with the LSP and therefore the LHC limits are automatically evaded. And we put here the Wino mass at 1.2 TeV, uh, which is above the LHC limits, but um, they are not uh, really important to explain G minus two. So as you can see, G minus two is very easily explained in all of this parameter space. Can you say one more time what the what the red dashed lines are? Yeah, I didn't say it at all uh, to save time, but the red uh, dashed line, the red, the, uh, the red dashed lines are contours for G minus two. And so I wanted you to focus only on the green band, which explains the current value. But here you could read off what G minus two could be elsewhere. So here G minus two would be 10. That would still be in the two sigma region of G minus two. And if we increase 10 beta a little bit, then you could explain G minus two completely also there. And the other red line is uh, from dark matter where we have direct detection constraints on the uh, dark matter particles. So that excludes this region where the Hixino mass is too small. And therefore we have too large uh, cross section between dark matter and uh, the direct search experiments. Right, so this plot uh, illustrates basically the same thing. So uh, the circle here on the top 
denotes the region, which is the same as in the previous plot, but now we lower here M2, the Reno mass. And you see from this plot that the blue region is excluded by LHC. So this is there to make LHC physicists happy because indeed the LHC excludes a large SUSE par uh, parameter space, but it is mainly sensitive on the Reno mass M2. So if the Reno mass is heavier than 900, it's allowed. And actually, if the Reno mass is smaller than 300 in this case, where the LSP is 250, it's also allowed. And then we get an additional second interesting parameter region, namely this Chargino neutralino co-annihilation region, where the Reno and the Vino have similar masses. So in there Dominic, we can of course yeah. also explain G minus two, yes. Do you remember which LHC search is particularly active in this blue region? Yeah, so this is the standard search, which is also shown here. The standard search with this highest uh, reach uh, from, for example, Atlas okay, okay, uh, good. for mm -hmm. Chardinos yeah, and Neutralinos, the standard mm -hmm. searches which exist from both experiments. And then here you see a super small thin blue line, which we found from some compressed spectrum searches and which we took great care to check that this does not invalidate the co-annihilation region. It's 5GEV different also, luckily. Okay, let me also show this. Uh, so Sven is there, so he has also worked on this and actually only few people seem to be interested in the case where the Higgsino or the Wino are the LSPs, but actually that seems to be quite attractive. Um, so here you have an example of a Higgsin LSP scenario. Um, uh, and the leptons are put also kind of close to the LSP in this case. And then again, you can explain G minus two very nicely. The only problem with this scenario is, uh, okay, let's first of all look at the plot. So the plot shows you here now LHC limits, which have this uh, usual shape similar to the original Atlas or CMS plots. Again, this is the standard uh, Chargino search. Uh, which excludes here a certain range of values of the Wino mass, which is now uh, the heavier Chargino because the Higgsino is the LSP. And so this uh, parameter region is excluded, but above it, if the Wino is heavier than 700 GeV or so, then the parameter space is open and you can easily explain G minus two in this parameter region as you see here in green. So this seems to be quite an attractive and quite generic scenario where you do not need any particular fine tuning between parameters. You just need to be above the LHC limits and then you can explain G minus two. The only problem with this scenario is that the dark matter relic density is too low. Um, and so you need non MSSM or beyond the MSSM dark matter candidates, maybe gravitinos or something else. But otherwise, the scenario is really viable and uh, quite attractive. Okay, so the SUSI summary is just uh, what I said in the beginning. So with Bino LSP, we have the two different co-annihilation scenarios, which are both viable. Higgsino and Wino LSP behave similarly. And in both cases, we can easily explain G minus two, uh, but we need to have some other dark matter candidate and some other scenarios like constrained MSSM are already excluded as explanations of G minus two. Let me, yeah, let me just spend one minute on these additional SUSI models to um, highlight the fact that supersymmetry doesn't always have to be the MSSM. So supersymmetry can be more. So in particular, uh, the left plot here shows an idea which we call 10 beta uh, going to infinity which realizes the idea that the muon mass is actually generated by loops. So this idea of radiative muon mass generation. So you set the downtype Higgs left to zero. That means the tree level mass is zero, 10 beta is infinity. And then uh, the muon mass is generated by loops, namely exactly by the same type of loop diagrams, which also give rise to G minus two. And uh, to make a long story short, let me only say, Normally, of course, you have G minus two given by uh, Yukawa times VU times a loop. And the muon mass is given by a tree level term. Now the muon mass is given by a loop term. And if you then replace or uh, eliminate the Yukawa coupling and express G minus two as a function of the measured muon mass, 
the loop factor and 10 beta cancels. So when we normally have a 10 beta enhancement in the MSSM, here you would get an enhancement like one over a loop factor, like one over alpha. So this, this behaves similarly to if 10 beta would be effectively 500 or 1000 or so. So you get very large contributions to G minus two and can explain the deviation at the TEV scale. And this is actually extremely similar to the recent study by Altmannshofer that some of you uh, might know about. Then uh, the MRSSM implements the idea that uh, there could be a continuous R symmetry instead of the discrete R parity. That is attractive, for example, from the point of view of n equal to SUSI. Um, but it forbids Majorana gate genomases and it forbids the Higgs genomas mu. And uh, as I explained, the 10 beta enhancement of the MSSM needs the Higgs genomas mu. Therefore, without mu, there is no 10 beta enhancement. And so in this uh, R symmetric SUSI standard model, there is no 10 beta enhancement and G minus two is super small as you see in the plot on the right. So you can only explain the current deviation if uh, several SUSI masses are below 200 GeV, which is quite of a uh, small and uh, weird parameter region. Let me skip this connection to flavor entirely. And let me come to leptoquarks and other chirally enhanced models. So here you first of all see as a starting point, the same plot that we already discussed last time where we see uh, the LHC limit in gray of 1.3 TeV and the green band is again the region where G minus two is explained. And the blue light region is the one which is disfavored by this fine tuning criterion where the muon mass gets 100% corrections or more, okay. So the Lagrangian that goes along with this uh, was written here. And um, again, let me only say the point of this uh, specific laptop work was that it can couple both to the right-handed and to the left-handed muon. And both couplings are to the top work and therefore we get an enhancement from M top over M mu. So because of that, uh, we can explain G minus two even with TeV scale masses. Now let me give some comments and also some highlights from uh, the other recent literature. So as we already discussed at the beginning today, you need a specific flavor pattern to make it work. So we assume here uh, only couplings between the muon and the top and nothing else. Furthermore, specific uh, laptop quark types work. So the laptop quarks can be classified according to their quantum numbers. And uh, this uh, object S1 is a specific spin zero laptop work with specific SU2 cross U1 quantum numbers and that work and a few other cases work in a similar way. So this uh, fact that we need this very weird or let's say specific flavor patterns has of course give, uh, given rise to model building efforts. And here is an example of a recent paper where they tried to formulate some uh, let's say high scale or some model where the flavor structure arises from some symmetry principle. And uh, the way uh, they came up with is as follows. So they uh, invent a new gauged uh, quantum number, a U1 symmetry with quantum number B minus three times L mu. So the new Z prime from this couples only to quarks and to the muon, but not to the electron and to the qu uh, tau lepton. So the muon is singled out and therefore there are laptop quarks with, which are charged under this new Z prime gauge group. And they then naturally couple only to the muon but not to electron and tau. So they call it muor quarks instead of laptop quarks. And then they invent two different such laptop quarks. One like we had it, but in addition also an S3 laptop quark and then uh, using these three new particles, Z prime, S1 and S3, mu or quarks, they can explain simultaneously G minus two and RK. Good, then another example of a recent study where they also wanted to discuss G minus two and B physics simultaneously. So here they did it with a spin one laptop quark instead of spin zero. And there again, uh, the quantum numbers 
can be investigated and there is one specific version, uh, the so-called U1 leptoquark, which allows couplings between the left and the right handed muon and B quarks and strange quarks. So here they do not have a symmetry reason, but they pick specific values of the couplings between muons and bottom and strange quarks. And by picking the couplings appropriately, they can also explain G minus two, RK and RD simultaneously. So this is the situation of leptoquarks. So you have, of course, a very rich flavor structure and can do many things with them, but kind of the concrete models which do everything simultaneously are maybe a little bit baroque. Let's briefly discuss the case of vector-like leptons. I said already some time ago that vector-like leptons in many ways behave very similarly to leptoquarks. And I would like to say this here also once again. So in order to understand the behavior of vector-like leptons, let's just uh, think of this leptoquark Feynman diagram once again with a leptoquark and the top in the loop. For the vector-like leptons, you simply need to replace the leptoquark by the normal standard model Higgs, which is also a scalar particle. So here you have the Higgs. And the other line is then the vector-like lepton instead of the top quark. And then what happens is that the vector-like lepton has to do a chirality flip from left to right. And then uh, the vector-like lepton can couple to the left and right-handed muon with two different couplings. And you get the same kind of enhancement that you also get with the top quark and the laptop quark. So here is a Lagrangian that uh, does exactly this. And I wrote it in the appropriate order. So you, you can maybe read it here with me. So we, we start with a right-handed muon written as ER here. Then we couple it to the left-handed doublet part of the vector-like lepton with a coupling lambda L. Then we do a Dirac mass from uh, the left-handed doublet to the right-handed doublet, couple uh, to the Higgs, the left-handed, uh, so the right-handed doublet to the left-handed singlet, couple it to a Higgs that gives the chirality flip at the fermion line, then again a Dirac mass, and finally the right-handed singlet is coupled to the left-handed muon with another coupling. And so this illustrates my answer to the question that we had four weeks ago uh, at the end of the talk. We need this uh, coupling of the vector-like lepton to the Higgs as well. Even though there are gauge invariant Dirac masses of the vector-like leptons, you need the coupling between the vector-like lepton and the Higgs in order to make the flip from the doublet part to the singlet part, which ultimately enables you to couple the vector-like lepton between the left-handed muon and the right-handed muon. So ultimately, uh, you just get the same behavior as for the leptoquark. You have couplings lambda L, lambda R times lambda bar in this case, and everything else behaves similarly. So you could also do um, explain G minus two for TV scale masses very clearly. But there is one additional thing which I would like to highlight which also plays to some uh, other discussions that we had already. Namely, there are now additionally three level contributions to the muon mass, not only loop, but also three level contributions to the muon mass, which are similar to seesaw like uh, contributions to the mass. So you imagine the loop that I described before with vector like lepton, you cut the Higgs, then you have three couplings to the Higgs and uh, externally you have the muon. So you get an effective Lagrangian with three powers of the Higgs field times mu left, mu right. And if you replace all the Higgses by WEFs, then you get a contribution to the muon mass, which is given by the same coupling structure as G minus two. And now the interesting thing is that if, uh, uh, if this is the dominant contribution to the muon mass, uh, then the relationship between the muon mass and the Higgs coupling is changed compared to the standard model because you have to expand this binomial H plus V to the third power gives you a uh, WEF to the third power plus three times the Higgs coupling. Therefore, you get a factor three in the ratio between the Higgs coupling to the muon mass compared to the standard model. And in, uh, if you square it, you get a factor nine in uh, the effective coupling strength between the Higgs and muons that you could measure experimentally in Higgs coupling measurements. 
So that is, of course, now uh, experimentally excluded, but it was not experimentally excluded when uh, they came up with this model a few years ago. So, and this illustrates a little bit what we said last time, namely, there is, uh, there is a very, very important relationship between G minus two and couplings between Higgs and muons. But there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the relationships G minus two Higgs coupling and the muon mass. So here you see uh, that you get factor nine effects in the Higgs coupling, but maybe you need only fact order one effects in the muon mass. Order one is not fine-tuned. So if you just explain the muon mass by this new tree level e effect, and then you would have a factor nine prediction in the Higgs coupling. While in other cases, for example, in the left hook work case, you could have fine tuning in the muon mass. You get uh, contributions to the muon mass, which are 10 times larger than the muon mass itself. You will also get large contributions to Higgs to mu mu, but not uh, factor nine, but maybe 20% or something like this. So therefore all these three quantities are important. They are all related, but there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, which is what I already said the last time. So this is illustrated here. Other similar models. So there are many generic three field extensions with such chiral enhancements. So vector-like leptons, leptoquark, supersymmetry, they all uh, behave like this, but there are many no-name models as well, which can be investigated. You can typically explain G minus two if you have such a chiral enhancement. And uh, some interesting statements have been made in the literature. If you restrict your class of models to renormalizable models with let's say uh, spin zero and spin one half fields, then you can show that you will need at least three new fields if you want to explain G minus two and dark matter simultaneously and evade LHC limits, of course. And you need at least four new fields in your theory if you also want to explain B physics at the same time. So you need quite complicated setups. All right, let us come to the final class of new physics explanations of G minus two, which is now completely different from the previous ones. Namely, we now focus uh, for the first time on light new physics as light as the muon mass or lighter or as light as the proton or something like this. Uh, which means that you have new neutral particles. Of course, the only particles which can be light are neutral and uh, that could be dark matter particles or generally particles from a dark sector or uh, just generic electrically neutral particles. So there are a few different kinds of uh, possibilities in this uh, field. Let me just give a small review. So first, um, it has been discussed a lot in the past decade or so, um, was the dark photon. The dark photon is a particle which is defined by a new U1 gauge boson, which only interacts with a standard model via this kinetic mixing, which is possible if one has two U1 gauge groups. Then the, it just inherits the couplings from the photon with a small mixing angle epsilon and the contributions to G minus two are given by this mixing angle epsilon square times uh, the standard model contributions. And this simple scenario was appealing in the beginning, but it's now completely excluded by uh, CC as many colors of many, many different experiments. They have completely eliminated the parameter space of this dark photon explanation. But then of course, uh, model builders can save the day. There is a variant dark Z, which is just a generalization. So you now also uh, allow not only kinetic mixing, but also mass mixing with a Z boson mass. And uh, you assume maybe additional particles in the dark sector. And so you assume that you do not know what does this dark Z decay into? Does it decay into standard model particles or does it decay into dark sector particles which are invisible? And because of this, uh, many of the experimental constraints do not apply. Uh, but there are still uh, relevant limits which one has to take into account. But uh, the simple minded picture is that such general dark Z models are viable explanations of G minus two. 
then uh, let me flip the page. So there is uh, another scenario, uh, Z prime. So Z prime is a little bit different from dark C. Z prime is of course also a new neutral gauge boson, but by Z prime, I have in mind something where we have quantum numbers such that standard model particles have direct charges under this new gauge group. So a um, particularly appealing possibility is a Z prime with a quantum number L mu minus L tau, which is anomaly free. So this has also been studied a lot already. And here is a very recent plot on this model where you see that also here, uh, this uh, L mu minus L tau scenario is very strongly constrained experimentally already, but there is a viable parameter space, just a small corner and actually Interestingly, the viable mass range is similar to the muon mass. So the Z prime of this kind should have masses of the order 20, 50, 100 MeV, so close to the muon mass. And then it can be a viable explanation of G minus two. The final possibility is uh, axion-like particles. Here, uh, the difficulty uh, from the theory point of view is that axion-like particles are described by non-renormalizable Lagrangians. So uh, you need a cutoff in your theory. And it has been shown recently that actually, uh, since you must somehow embed uh, these models into some ultraviolet completion, the ultraviolet completion actually can significantly change the picture because the ultraviolet completing particles also by construction must give contributions to G minus two, which might actually dominate the contributions from the axion like particles that you are actually interested in. But ignoring this problem, one can simply say uh, that axion like particles can contribute to G minus two by such again bar Z like diagrams where you um, emit or exchange such an axion like particle, which could be a scalar or a pseudo scalar a particle between the muon and an effective gamma gamma axion vertex. Okay, and uh, then you can explain G minus two from such diagrams in a parameter space again, where the masses of those particles are around between the muon mass and one GeV, roughly speaking. Okay, actually I didn't go so much over time. So let us now conclude the three hours of lectures on G minus two. The main points I wanted to make on BSM physics are as follows. So first of all, the discrepancy is quite a large discrepancy. We have to explain something that is twice as large as the standard model weak contributions, even though generically new physics contributions are suppressed by squares of masses. We have to keep in mind that G minus two is loop induced CP and flavor conserving and chirality flipping. So in order to get large contributions, you need to maximize those complementarities with respect to these properties. And so the two generic um, directions that you can take are these two here. So one possibility is you go to rather light neutral particles. So either very light new particles like on the last slide, axions, light set prime, dark Z and so on, uh, where you have a connection to a dark sector or generic dark matter particles. And um, also in high scale models like supersymmetry, often dark matter particles appear in explanations of G minus two. So that is one kind of way how you can evade many other experimental constraints, but still get significant contributions to G minus two. And the other way, which is the one we mainly discussed are via chirality flip enhancements. And uh, those are the things that provide this window to the muon mass generation mechanism, because the muon mass and the coupling to the Higgs and the Yukawa sector, this is all related to those chirality flip enhancements. And in the examples you have seen that most uh, models actually need to provide such an enhancement in order to be viable. So in the two X doublet model, we have 10 beta square enhancement in supersymmetry. We have 10 beta enhancement. Lepto quarks have this chiral enhancement vector like leptons as well. So many, many models um, which are of interest for us involve such a chiral enhancement. And all these models 
then have a very interesting rich flavor structure. Uh, and if they get confirmed, we will learn tremendously much on the origin of flavor or on the Higgs mechanism. So which models can accommodate a large deviation? Many models can do it as we have just seen, but uh, definitely not all models. Many models are excluded and uh, definitely all models that we have discussed, I would say, are strongly constrained by complementary experimental data. So there is not a single model I know of where you could generically draw a random point in parameter space and without saying anything else, uh, immediately explain G minus two. Like it might have been the case 20 years ago for a supersymmetry. I think there is not such a model available right now. So here is again the list of scenarios, but I think we do not need to go through all these different models to remind ourselves of the details, because I think that is probably clear. So let me come to the final conclusion of the three lectures. So what did I want to tell you? I wanted to give you an up-to-date survey of uh, G minus two from the BSM point of view. And actually I did not try to promote any particular uh, best model or my favorite uh, theory that you should all now believe in. I try to be uh, as open-minded as I could um, possibly be and give you a, a hopefully kind of objective survey of what is available. Of course, uh, still incomplete and biased by uh, my own work and so on, but nevertheless, I try to be uh, more or less um, complete. And um, most importantly, I wanted to give you some conceptual background and some uh, theory insights and uh, some conceptual ways how you can think about G minus two. For me, this was always very helpful to have these chirality flips in mind and how they are related to flavor, how uh, they provide connections between different observables like G minus two mu to gamma, G minus two of the electron and so on and how uh, these provide a connection between um, G minus two explanations and the origin of flavor or Yukawa couplings. So these are the most important points I want you to take home. And uh, hopefully this can also help you in your future work on G minus two, or if you encounter further talks on G minus two, you can uh, maybe correlate what you see uh, newly invented models with uh, those kinds of uh, ways of thinking about chirality flips and uh, relationships between observables. So we are, however, only at the beginning, not yet at the end, because uh, this was just the first set of data from the Fermilab measurement and uh, everything is uh, continuing to be improved. And so just next week, starting on Monday, there will be the next theory initiative workshop at KEK where the hadronic contributions from the standard model will of course be further scrutinized. And uh, from the experimental point of view, as you know, only 6% of the data uh, that is ultimately to come has been used in this first uh, data set. That was from run one, run two and run three have already been completed, but not yet analyzed. Run four is all uh, just ongoing and run five will come in the future. And uh, therefore uh, definitely the experimental determination of G minus two will improve and become even more solid like will the standard model theory contributions. And therefore we can look forward to a very, very interesting future uh, with respect to G minus two, which might provide a direct confirmation of uh, physics beyond the standard model. 50 years after the standard model has been constructed theoretically and after five decades of over and over confirmations of standard model predictions in collider experiments. So thank you very much for your attention and thanks for the invitation. And let's see whether there are further questions. Thank you, Dominic, for these wonderful set of lectures and in particular today. Um, that, that was very, I know I, I'm really sorry that I missed the first two. So thanks a lot. And oh, we have already the first question. Maybe I ask the first question myself. Uh, if, if, if I give you some money, which model would you put it on? Ah, okay. Uh, this is the question I wanted to avoid because I wanted to <laughs> stay so open-minded, but you know, I uh, actually, 
uh, my attitude is a little bit negative right now, so I didn't want to push uh, these negative statements too much, but of course, I do not see any model which is really convincing, to be perfectly honest. Out of all those examples that I have worked on myself, out of all the examples that others have worked on, I do not see the single model which is uh, more beautiful, more attractive than any other model. Uh, but if you want to uh, put my money on something, uh, I wouldn't like to do it in a serious way, but uh, supersymmetry is now still more attractive than other scenarios, surprisingly so. Because, of course, in, in the past 20 years, of course, many people have uh, lost uh, faith in supersymmetry. Uh, but looking at the comparisons between all the models, I have to say, uh, you first explain dark matter with Dino like LSPs, then automatically LHC limits are evaded. Then you can nicely explain G minus two in a wide open parameter space. So that to me still looks very attractive. But of course, um, uh, it's hard to say I believe in supersymmetry after all the negative results from the LHC, but still it uh, seems to be more attractive than uh, many other scenarios. But uh, let's see what other people might invent in the future for uh, okay. we ourselves. Georg. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much for the, for the very nice uh, lecture, uh, Dominic. Uh, concerning this, uh, this issue of, of, of scrutinizing uh, the standard model prediction. I mean, maybe for this model uh, explanation, as you said, it all looks a bit uh, uh, difficult. So maybe for these models, it would even be better if in the future, uh, uh, the discrepancy was reduced a little bit if the standard model value came somewhat closer to the experimental result. So I was wondering whether from the other lattice groups, there have been any any updates on when to expect uh, a result from, from them in order to, to to scrutinize this uh, uh, lattice uh, 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 computation a bit more. Has there been any update on, on their timeline when, when we can expect any new results from them? Yes, uh, for sure. Uh, the answer could be even more precise next week because as I said, uh, it happens to be a, a workshop about this next week. But what I know is uh, that unfortunately, it's not really promising to expect any big update anytime soon on the scale of a few months. They just need uh, too long running time for their extensive computing uh, efforts. And um, even though, of course, all these lattice groups are working on it, uh, the computing time they have available is uh, apparently not enough to get very fast progress. So the timeline that I know about is really at the scale of one or two years or something like this. But what yeah. will happen, uh, for example, at the workshops is, of course, that they compare intermediate results. And uh, they have defined or on, and will further define many intermediate quantities, which might be able to uh, be calculated in a quicker way, where even if you have different lattice discretizations, different lattice artifacts and so on, but uh, apparently those quantities nevertheless allow meaningful comparisons between different calculations. And in this way, they hope to make also quicker progress in the understanding of what is going on there. Okay, thank you. More questions for Dominic. Any more questions? Sven. Yeah. Thanks again for this uh, very nice talk and this lecture. Uh, although I worked on this for as long as you effectively, not with this intensity, but I still learned a lot. So it was really nice. I think you were a bit harsh with the models by saying that you can't, there's no model where you pick a random parameter point and G minus two comes out correctly. I think this applies to effectively all measurements that we do, yeah, that are predicted by a model. You can't predict the correct value over the entire parameter space. As you were saying correctly, this gives us constraints and this is perfectly fine. Yeah, but uh, to say a model that would predict this value over the whole parameter space, <laughs> This just cannot exist. I'm sure. Yeah, this is too much to ask for. Yeah. That is, of course, very clear. But I, I don't know how you feel about it. But um, if you imagine uh, the situation from 20 years ago, where you could say uh, you invent the MSSM, what would you like the MSSM parameters to look like? You would say, OK, random masses between 100 and 500 GeV, and so on, random values of 10 beta between 10 and 50. 
okay, if you would draw uh, very high masses and very small 10 beta, then you would not explain G minus two, but everything else would be kind of stable and you would always get into the right ballpark. Now, uh, this that is, is not a, the case. A prejudice, yeah. I mean, we know already that some SUSY masses, if SUSY is realized, must be high in order to get, for example, the Higgs boson mass. Correct. That is exactly yeah. the point. So, and so that is, uh, that is the difficulty that I see with supersymmetry. So of course, if supersymmetry is correct, then we know how it is realized. So it's already constrained so strongly by many experiments. It is constrained by the Higgs mass, by LHC data. So we know there must be some splitting if it's true. Uh, between the sleptons and the squawks or between third generation, first generation, we know all that. Uh, the question would be what kind of fundamental dynamics generates those patterns of masses, if you are interested in this question. So, no, um, of course I'm interested, yeah, but right. in order to, to say this, we have to measure many of them and then yes, yes, we right. say and, uh, so. Yeah you know, bottom up approach. Yes, yeah. I, 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 probably you would agree that uh, focusing so strongly on the constraint MSSM 20 years ago or minimal supergravity was maybe uh, pushing the bias into a wrong direction because this everybody I was thinking yeah. that this, uh, that is how supersymmetry should be. And if it's not like that, it's kind of unnatural. Uh, mm. That is uh, still the feeling that uh, I, I have, but it's a wrong feeling. Nevertheless, the pattern that we seem to need uh, does not seem to follow any particular reasoning that I could reasonably come up with. The most attractive um, scenario, if you want to ask me uh, of my taste, would be this hexino like LSP, because there I see the most natural kind of parameter space emerging uh, there. It's really like this. You only say the hexino is the lightest, then mm -hmm. some other particles are a little bit heavier, then quite naturally you evade LHC limits and can explain G minus two. You only need to invent another explanation of G minus the, of dark matter. There's always the axiom. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, for, for instance, for these Bino-like LSP scenarios, they work very well, but uh, here you really uh, need to <laughs> fix the mass splittings between all the various particles. Yeah, but also kind this of is in, in a special complete way. agreement with dark matter. Yeah, dark matter tells you that you should have a small mass. Yeah, it comes from dark matter. Yes, yes, it comes yeah. from dark matter. G and, minus and, two but is this not also a culprit. Also, the LHC constraints. So G it, minus it, two is not the uh, culprit. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so that's right. Okay. That's right. I yeah, so it's, it's nice. of course, um, a very, very open question, but that is also why it's a very interesting time we are now experiencing. So because the constraints are building up and if it uh, remains a deviation from the standard model, then we are forced to take some of these ideas seriously, then yeah. some of them must be right. And that is, of course, extremely exciting. Thanks again. But that's love that you mentioned the light Higgsino scenarios because here of course the linear collider would be lovely but not oh. only that also here at Hamburg our um, CMS group they do lovely work on this in particular on this uh, light Higgsino like scenarios and and, and 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 proving the mass resolution and I think it's perfectly well so Sam was here but now they are gone and then we could say well just continue and uh, this lovely to improve and, and, and enhance even the LHC region in this challenging area. Yeah, right. So I think that would be very motivated, very much motivated. And also from the theory point of view, not so many people work on this MSSM scenario with light Higgsinos and even less people work on light Winos, it seems to me. But even that could be a viable possibility. Absolutely. Maybe I can make I, have one... I love this. <laughs> I could make one more remark here. Uh, we looked at this also with respect to direct detection experiments, which one has to take into account, of course. And it seems that these scenarios uh, end up above the neutrino floor and can probably be covered with the next round of direct detection experiments. Mm -hmm. So it's another way of uh, testing these models. Mm. And they, they look promising, I would say. Yes. Mm. More questions? Georg. Yeah, and the light Higgsinos are also when, if you talk about this uh, kind of naturalness issues of SUSY, then, then, then it's of course also, uh, uh, in particular, the, the Higgsino that you want to have light. So it would also be uh, uh, motivated from this point of view. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, Dominic, what you meant before when you said, well, over a wide parameter space, uh, it seems to work. I mean, there was also this is also this kind of this picture from 10 or 15 years ago about the dark matter when there was this infamous bulk region of SUSI where you would just with any value of the mm. of the of of the parameters you would get the dark matter uh, uh, relic abundance roughly right. And then and then the mass limits were pushed, and then one had to go into these specific configuration like the core annihilation and, and and so on. And I was always always in favor of this kind of bulk region, and the and the Higgsino is kind of the, hmm. the successor of the bulk region. Right. Now we just come out, we come out too low, but coming out too low is still something that we say, okay, there is other room for, hmm. for dark matter, but it brings us back in a way in, into this scenario of the kind of bulk, uh, uh, the bulk region. So that that makes it, at least from my perspective, all is it an additional region that makes it favorable. Uh, yeah, or I agree. Yes, I mean, of course, in General, it's completely true that if you have a measurement like dark matter or G minus two, you eliminate one dimensionality of your parameter space. So that's obvious. But uh, in dark matter, it's particularly tricky to get the correct value. So uh, at least if, if you have a B no LSP, you need these specific mass splittings, which um, yeah, can be true, but it seems to be a little bit artificial to achieve them from some high scale dynamics. More questions. Of course, let me also mention, since we now focus, by, because we, we speak here among many SUSI uh, people, but uh, we should <laughs> not forget that there is a very interesting BSM physics beyond supersymmetry. And um, uh, here, G minus two, provides also lots of motivation to look beyond SUSI for sure. I mean, uh, these laptop work explanations, they are also uh, completely viable and they just have the problem of these completely complicated flavor structures. But uh, who knows? I mean, if uh, before discovering the second and third generation, nobody would think that this uh, should exist. But um, if leptoquarks exist, we will just have lots and lots of flavor measurements available, and we will understand in the future where this flavor structure will come from. So it would be extremely attractive also if something like that yeah, but uh, I would think be it's, realized. But I think it's fair to say that those models uh, that try to explain both G minus two and the flavor anomalies are not particularly beautiful, though, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. definitely constructed. Right. I mean, you and mentioned a few of them today. If mm. I remember your plots correctly, also these uh, like lepto quark models or so, they seem to be very close to exclusion limits, always the allowed parameter ranges. Like okay, this is only because yeah. I draw this uh, fine tuning region. The fine tuning is, of yeah. course, not taken okay. seriously by everybody, and you don't have to take it seriously. I do, but. Um, yeah. But it's an order of magnitude limit. So in that sense, it, you could also draw it a factor two higher. Then it would look uh, like a more Slightly open better. parameter space. Yes. I mean, nowadays there are lots of papers on uh, muon colliders, which uh, formulate those no-go theorems that you uh, will definitely be able to understand G minus two if one has a muon collider, even if G minus two is explained by 100 TeV particles. So actually the question that I uh, can ask into the audience is uh, whether anybody has come up with a concrete um, fundamental theory where G minus two is explained with 100 TeV particles. Uh, these are effective field theory arguments. And then uh, by putting this dimension six operator with a 100 TeV coefficient, one can explain G minus two, but I have honestly speaking not yet seen a concrete model which behaves like this. So for me, the models always have this kind of two TeV upper mass limit beyond which it becomes hard to explain G minus two. I'm sorry, I cut off uh, another question from Jan, I think. But you now ask a question for the audience. I don't know. Maybe somebody wants to answer this first. Well, let me ask my question and then the audience can think about a little bit how to answer your question. Um, I, I, let me come back to supersymmetry. I thought supersymmetry, the killer of supersymmetry in the LHC is the little hierarchy problem. 
Mm. Uh, did did you play this down in this in your contribution, or is it? Uh, or how, what would be your answer to this? Yeah, no, the little hierarchy problem is not really uh, folded in to this discussion. But uh, Georg was alluding to it uh, so that we would at least like the Higgsino to be as light as possible. And uh, that would be an argument to explain G minus two via this light Higgsino scenario. Mm -hmm. And we had recently a talk by Howie Baer on this, who is also a proponent of light Higgsinos. And he provided explicit benchmark scenarios where it is realized also um, compatible with uh, this little fine tuning uh, and uh, the fine tuning was not very significant according to the measure that he has put in place. Okay. But there is actually also the opposite uh, going on. Uh, so if you ignore this little fine tuning problem, then uh, there are lots of, let's say, attractive ways to explain G minus two if the Higgsino mass is very heavy like 5 TeV, even 10 TeV Higgsino masses because of this linear increase that I mentioned from one of the Feynman diagrams. And um, then there is this argument from model building where you have uh, the set mass arising from the minimization of the Higgs potential and then the Higgs potential gets additional contributions from U square. So in order to make the set mass small, uh, when you have at the same time very heavy squawks which feed into very heavy uh, soft scalar masses in the Higgs sector, you need very large mu in order to compensate and get small uh, Z mass. So then you have large mu and this um, fits well to getting large G minus two contributions uh, from these cases where you have a light Bino and very heavy Higgsino. So that would go against fine tuning discussions, but it's actually an attractive way to explain G minus two as well. Okay. More questions, final round of questions for Dominic. I don't see any more. I think the experts now scared all the other uh, part of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Dominic, thanks a lot for the yes. three wonderful lectures. And thank you, uh, uh, we really enjoyed it. And I thank all of you to be um, to be present. And um, I wish you a good summer. Probably we don't see each other before the summer. No. So Dominic has a, has a few more weeks to go. Yes. We are almost at the end of the term. Oh, okay. So. Good. Okay. Then thank Have you nice very summer. much again for the invitation. Bye-bye, everyone. See you hopefully soon in person. Dominic.